Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to our Future City webinar on this lovely Wednesday day. Um, before we get started, could I get just a couple people to click the raise hand button um, on your webinar control panel to make sure that you can hear me clearly and that you can see the Future City logo on the screen? Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Well, welcome to the Future City Headquarters Eye on Engineering webinar for 2018. We're very happy to have you join us today. My name is Jake Williams. I'm the program coordinator for the Future City competition. Also on the line is Future City's program manager, Maggie Dressel, and she'll be answering um, some of your questions as we go along today. So before we get started, I just wanted to mention a couple housekeeping items. Uh, the platform we're using today is GoToWebinar. If the sound quality on your computer uh, uh, system is not uh, good enough, there's a teleconference line that you can call into, which sometimes has slightly higher quality. Uh, the number for that is on the screen, and the access code and audio pin should be available on your webinar control panel. So feel free to switch over to that if you're having any audio troubles. A recording of this webinar will be posted on the futurecity.org resources section in the next day or two. Um, and also, if you're looking for webinars about specifics on the Future City competition itself, things like best practices and advice, deliverables and recommendations on how to, the program actually works, you can check out our two recent educator webinars. And for background on this year's challenge, uh, a webinar that's good for the whole team, you can check out the Powering Our Future theme webinar. Um, the recording for all three of these webinars are on the resources page for futurecity.org. So feel free to go back if you haven't already seen those. Those are some great resources. You might have noticed that you are muted as an attendee. Uh, if you have any questions for our panelists today, you can just type them into the webinar control panel question box. Um, feel free to type them in throughout the course of the webinar. And at the end, uh, after each three presentation, uh, each of the three presentations have taken place, we'll pose as many of the questions to our panel as we can. So I've been the program coordinator here at Future City Headquarters for um, almost two years. But before that, uh, years ago, back when I was in middle school, I was actually a Future City participant myself. I really, really loved Future City, and I had a really great time working with my team. But before I had started on the project, I didn't really have a clear idea of what engineers actually did day to day. I had a general sense of the work that they did, but I didn't know about all the different types of engineers and technical professionals that were out there. So now, one of the things that I like best about my job is that I get to meet with and I get to hear from all different types of STEM professionals every day. So our presenters today are each from professional societies that care deeply about the work that they do, and they want to pass on their interest to the next generation. That's why they each sponsor a special award at finals at the finals competition. So both Future City finals and regional competitions have different special awards that teams are eligible for. You can check with your regional coordinator to find out uh, what specific special awards are offered in your local competition. But the point of the special awards is not just winning. Uh, it's a way to dive into a specific engineering or technical field and learn more about it. So that's why today we have professionals from three different societies to talk a bit about the work that they do um, and the, the kind of daily activity that, that goes into being uh, the professional the kind of professional that they are. Uh, when the webinar is over, I bet you'll have at least a few ideas about things to pursue or explore for your own Future City project. So without further ado, I'm very excited to introduce our guest speakers today. Professor Kevin Amendi from ASHRAE, Terry Howell from the American Society of Agricultural and Biological Engineers, and Scott Bishop and Brad Roberts from the National Council for Examiners, the National Council of Examiners for Engineering and Surveying. Our first speaker is uh, Kevin Amendi. He's an associate professor 
in the Mechanical and Industrial Engineering Department at Montana State University. Since 2003, he has taught HVAC and manufacturing courses while performing energy efficiency research. Professor Amendi has served as the MSU Student Branch Advisor for ASHRAE for over 13 years and has held both student activities and research promotion chair positions for the Big Sky Chapter. Each year, he takes 15 or more students to the ASHRAE Winter Meeting and Exposition to show them the world of HVAC and R. For the 2019 meeting, uh, the professor is serving as a post-high chair for the Student Activities Committee and is leading the student program. Professor Amandi, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Um, so future city competition is super important for ASHRAE because in the ASHRAE community, um, our mission is to advance the arts and science of heating, ventilation, air conditioning, and refrigeration to serve humanity and promote a sustainable world. So not just reading slides, but really this resonates with a lot of the youth today and my students, right? So I teach college uh, age students, future engineers, um, and architects who want to go out and, and change the world. So this is a great society that promotes that. And it used to stand for, our society used to be um, represented as the American Society of uh, Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning uh, Engineers, but we're a global entity and we actually have chapters throughout the world now um, and, and it and is far reaching, so it's very important. So let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. Okay, so um, our motto is Shaping Tomorrow's Built Environment Today. So with this you know it's a global technical society that provides essential resources for sustainable design construction and operation of buildings and their systems ashray is unique because its membership is drawn from a wide range of disciplines related to the hvac and r which stands for refrigeration uh, field over 57,000 individuals from more than 130 nations belong to this society among them are students, consulting engineers, mechanical contractors, building owners, and employees of manufacturing uh, companies, educational institutions, research organizations, um, government agencies, and any other agency who, who um, is concerned with environmental uh, controls. And that would include um, USGBC, which is the United States Green Building Council. So if you've heard of LEED, LEED Rating Systems, um, they participate with ASHRAE um, extensively. Next slide, please. So if we start looking at the built environment, so this is all of our buildings in all of our cities, um, doesn't matter how small or or big those cities are, we have different engineers with different roles. And so in our society, consulting engineers are a big component of that. So they take these big ideas, right? And they work in design teams with architects and, and landscapers and um, general contractors. They work with all sorts of disciplines, um, but these folks are the, the individuals who are gonna design the building itself, right? So um, the architects may come up with ideas of what the building should look like, what materials it should be built out of. Um, but then, because we are creatures of comfort, um, we like to be um, just at the right temperature, right? Not too hot, not too cold. But in this process, we have to have systems within the building that are gonna condition that space. So when we're in our classroom, we don't want it to be super hot because we're, we're uncomfortable and we're irritable to our teachers. So we want to go through and, and be comfortable in those spaces. So we need a little bit of cooling in that area. So consulting engineers are going to design the system. So whether that's flowing water or, or pushing air into those spaces, they're going to transfer energy. And, we, and this is going to be thermal energy. So this is heating and cooling. And so they design the ductwork. They design the radiant baseboard heaters that you may be sitting in in your classroom right now. Um, and they make sure that there's adequate fresh outside air, too, coming into those spaces. So we want to be breathing good quality air. So consulting engineers work um, on the design components of this, this area. Okay, so next slide, please. 
So in addition to consulting engineers um, that participate in our society, so they design to our codes and standards, um, we have contractors and manufacturers of equipment. So the image on the left, you see there's a uh, man standing on top of a uh, piece of equipment um, with a ladder and he's currently installing different pieces of equipment or connecting pipes um, and ductwork and electrical uh, connections to these pieces of equipment that are going to serve the purpose of keeping you um, warm enough or cool enough and make sure you have fresh air. And so contractors participate um, in this in this field as well. And so it's very important that when architects and engineers design a building that it can be built, right? Because we have computers today and there's all sorts of great design tools out there. So I think you use um, SimCity to, to design your stuff. You can make anything possible on the computer, but can you actually construct it in real life? And so um, working with mechanical contractors or any of the other contractors that are going to be um, installing components in the building, you've got to work and make sure everything um, fits into its appropriate place. And so these individuals are really knowing the ins and outs of um, the, the consulting engineer designs it, the mechanical contractor has to install it, and sometimes they catch mistakes. And so they make engineers much better if they uh, work collaboratively with those engineers on their design and so they give a lot of good feedback in that process so um, that's another key area equipment manufacturers so um, mechanical engineering um, ties into all of these elements you can do consulting engineering you can be a mechanical contractor but you can also design the equipment itself and so just like if you um, have a phone now, you're a bunch of middle schoolers now, so I would assume that, that technology is, is a big part of your life and gadgets and gizmos. Well, if you don't want to design airplanes or cars, another opportunity um, to have a huge impact on the world is to design heating and cooling equipment. So there's a lot that goes into these different components. So if you like to design and build stuff, you could actually work for an equipment manufacturer and um, come up with new, new, more energy efficient uh, pieces of equipment that can have a humongous impact on the world. Because if you make one minor change in energy efficiency on that piece of equipment, but it's installed in millions of locations around the world, um, it can have a humongous impact on on the energy we use as a society. So that's an important aspect. Next slide, please. So in addition to be able to go out and practice engineering as a consulting engineer, mechanical contractor, and uh, uh, designing equipment for equipment manufacturers, there's all sorts of great research opportunities. And so um, looking at research, this is an example of a residential project where um, my students were able to go through and look at different renewable energy um, technologies and be able to compare these into a specific um, building. So in this case, this house is um, designed to to lead standards, so it's ASHRAE standards and, and building code, but then to lead rating system, which basically pushes the envelope to ba make it um, very energy efficient, resource conscious, and aware. And so in this one, we were able to, to compare different assembly types. So if you look at the, the image of the house, you see there's green on top, which is um, structurally insulated panels. And so they're actually foam panels, not typical um, wood two by four construction with insulation between them. So they're actually big sandwiches with spray foam insulation in between them. The white portions are actually what we call insulated concrete forms. So between that white, that's just white styrofoam that looks like a Lego block with concrete poured between it. So um, there's different technologies and and in the built environment, we try to look at the aspects of how much energy is transferring through the walls. And so we try to minimize those things. And so we can save a lot of energy just by designing um, better built buildings. 
The other image on that on this picture has a, an example of it looks like a really long stretched out slinky. That is a geothermal heat exchanger. So we put that down on the ground and we can either put energy into the earth or extract energy out of the earth. Next slide, please. Um, another cool research project um, that ties into government um, entities and, and other areas, um, government buildings, um, they have mandates of energy reduction at certain levels um, throughout the year. And so part of our research is an off-grid research facility at Lamar Buffalo Ranch in Yellowstone National Park. And so this one utilizes um, photovoltaic, so solar panels. It utilizes micro hydro, so basically water power, and a backup generator to supply all the energy for this educational facility. And so students have the opportunity to research um, how much energy they can generate on this. So in essence, it's kind of like a small city. Next slide, please. So all of these tie into our big picture. Um, when we start looking at energy, right, these are the challenges that your future cities are going to have to overcome. Population growth, right, we have significant population growth um, by 2050, and so therefore we have to have more buildings and more infrastructure to house everybody. Um, in addition to that, more food, right, and more electrical uh, energy is going to have to be um, produced. So we have to be able to um, optimize and do things as efficient as possible. When we look at buildings, especially in your city, most buildings utilize um, over 60 to 70 percent of our energy. That's a big number and of that about 40 percent of it is just to keep you comfortable heating, cooling, and fresh air. So those are things that you have to look at. And so it, when we look at energy efficiency, Anytime we are burning a fossil fuel to generate electricity that comes um, from power plants, it has CO2 emissions, so this is all of our greenhouse gases. So we want to reduce that um, as much as possible so we don't keep on heating the planet up. Um, and then finally, how do we tie in renewable energies to that existing electrical grid system? So these are all big challenges um, for your future city project. And ASHRAE supports all of those areas in a variety of different ways. So that's all I've got for you today. So final slide. If you have additional questions, feel free to email me anytime um, uh, following this webinar. Great. Thank you so much, Kevin. That was really interesting. Um, if anyone in the audience has questions, you can type them now, and we'll get to them after all the presenters have gone. Our next guest is Terry Howell. He's the executive director of the Food Processing Center at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. The center provides consulting and services to the food industry, like helping startups navigate regulations and providing access to pilot plants for product testing to multinational corporations. Prior to joining the University of Nebraska, he was the senior manager of product development at McKee Foods Corporation. In that position, Mr. Howell managed the daily operations of a group of food scientists and technicians whose primary tasks were to develop, test, and launch new products for the company's different brands. He is a past president of the American Society of Agricultural and Biological Engineers. Welcome, Mr. Howell. Can you tell us a bit about ASABE and what types of work that you do? Sure. Yeah, thanks, Jake. And I you know, appreciate the opportunity to be here. I have a I'll give you my, my story with Future Cities. Um, ASABE, the American Society of Agricultural and Biological Engineers, has has a has a good and long history with with the Future Cities competition. We feel like it is is an extremely valuable um, opportunity for for middle schoolers to to really understand um, engineering, and and it's a great chance for us as as agricultural and biological engineers to expose. Uh, those students to the, the, the field of, of of agricultural and biological engineering. Um, when I was president of, of ASABE in the about four years ago, I was able to to attend the Future Cities Finals competition for a couple of years, and and I was able to judge 
uh, both of our special awards, and I I was blown away by the talent of uh, of young people across this country, and uh, and I'm I'm sure they are continuing to impress with their projects, and so I'm grateful for a chance to just share a few ideas about about uh, my profession and and some things for for these teams out there to to think about as they as they um, you know work on their projects. I'd like to thank Kevin for for his presentation. He did a great job, and and he he exposed um, the audience to several ideas that overlap with with what agricultural biological engineers do in, in different in different settings. And so, I think it, it really provides a great chance for for all of the listeners to really think about um, the fact that engineering. Um, it does have, there are lots of separate disciplines that have their own unique um, uh, kind of special um, identities, but, but there's a lot of overlap as well. So engineering principles that are learned in, in some disciplines can be translated and applied um, in, in a variety of fields. And so that's one of the messages I'll deliver today a little bit about, um, about my profession is that that it is quite broad, and and as students think about the the implications for their for their projects, um, there's a lot of different directions that they could take. Um, but one thing that I, I certainly thought about was the fact that um, as as Kevin just shared things about um, uh, kind of unique and and groundbreaking uh, energy conservation techniques. Those same kinds of energy conservation technique can, can be applied in the field of agriculture as well. And, and so as, as you work on your future city and think about things like energy, um, you, you, can, you can apply your learning and your ideas across a, a couple of different sectors in your, in your city design so that you could you can make yourself attractive for the special awards across several different disciplines. So I hope I can explain that a little bit better as we, as we move forward. So um, I, I think we'll take the next slide and I'll just kind of begin to explain a little bit about kind of the broad reach of agricultural and biological engineers. We call ourselves ABEs. Um, the, the, um, the profession really kind of crystallized and formed uh, officially in the early 1900s, but as you can imagine, um, people have been trying to improve um, the way we do agriculture for as long as, as as humankind has existed. So people have always been looking for better ways to cultivate the land and to um, to grow animals and to process food. And so, um, Agricultural and biological engineers have have really united over the last 100 years as a profession to to advance the science and engineering around those topics. Um, and it, it, it's a broad um, profession, but it really focuses on on engineering related to the necessities of life. And so that's maybe the the easiest way to describe the profession. If you think about what what is necessary for for life to exist, uh, biology and agriculture are going to be touching that. And so uh, we're thinking about clean air and clean water, uh, abundant, safe food and fiber. And, and fiber is a term that we use that would that would relate to things like cotton and other products that are that are that are renewable resources that are used, um, you know, for many different uh, purposes. And then things like sustainable soil and energy. So so th those things are are critical for life to exist, and and agricultural and biological engineers care deeply about um, ensuring that that those resources will be abundant and and available for for the next generation. So as I think about about you all who are 30 years younger than I am, um, you know, ensuring that you know when you're my age that you have access to um, the food and water and clean air and energy and all those things is really important. And so as you design a future city, those are critical tasks as well. Uh, Kevin shared a great slide towards the end, and I hope these slides are available to you to review later on. Uh, but he showed a great slide that showed the population 
expectation in 2050 of, of over 9 billion people. And so that's 2 billion more people that are, that are here today. And, and so we have got to find ways to, to not only retrieve more um, productivity from our land, but also um, manage um, those resources you know, more efficiently every, you know, every year so that, so that, that, that giant population on this earth will, um, will be, be able to be fed and, 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 and have water and all those things. So you're, this generation of future city designers that's, that's working right now, you're really looking at, you know, having a, you know, in the year 2050, you're going to be in the, in the midst, in the middle of your life. And so it's going to be a, a really interesting time, and and, I'm, and I think it's exciting for you to be thinking about uh, what those things might look like. So, uh, Jake, we'll move on to the next slide real quick. <clears throat> so this this graphic is is one that has been uh, developed by our professional society, um, and we've used it for about the last four or five years to tell our story. And so I've I've kind of um, covered a couple of those topics just that we're we're looking to positively impact water, energy, and the environment to benefit the people of the world. And so you'll see on the on the right panel um, that the areas of impact are, are energy, soil, air, water, food, and fiber. And then the types of engineering that, that agricultural and biological engineers work in are kind of um, found in that middle technical focus um, chevron. And so we work on facilities, so those would be things descri uh, described by Kevin with with um, built systems like buildings and and how what's what are the most efficient ways to house animals? What are the most efficient and safe ways to grow crops and those kinds of things? Uh, machinery systems would be kind of a traditional, a very traditional view of of agricultural engineering. So things like tractors, combines, types of equipment that harvest and process and, and move food and, and, and other agricultural products around. And, and if, you, if you grow up in a city, if you're in an urban environment and you haven't been exposed to, to those kinds of things, it, it, it shouldn't take you long just to do, even do some thinking or I'm sure you could even find something on YouTube or Google that would show you the kinds of systems, the, the, the massive scale that's required to produce um, food and other uh, agricultural products for our, our, our population. Natural resources and environmental systems would be uh, engineers who, work, who look at ways to ensure thing that um, areas like streams and rivers and, and, and lakes and waterways are, are maintained with a high level of purity. Um, they also would look at ensuring things like um, you know that, that agricultural runoff is not creating um, problems like polluting our, our our environment and those kinds of things. Um, and then animal systems and plant systems are are those, um, like I said, kind of animal containment facilities. Things like um, you know what 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 are the what's the most efficient way to to milk cows? What's the most efficient way to um, to have an aquaculture system for, for plants. And then processing systems, which is my specialty, is, is the types of engineering that, that, that's required to, to take raw agricultural and food products and convert them into something that, um, that can be safe and, 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 and used at, you know, whenever it's convenient for, for, for the population. So, as, as Jake said, I worked for a food company for the last 16 years, and so that food company, you know, took things like flour and sugar and other products and made bakery products that that could then be consumed, you know, later on and, and preserve those those raw ingredients. And so that's just a broad kind of review of of the discipline. And what I'd like to talk about, kind of in, in my last minute or two, is is how um, how you might um, think about our special uh, our special awards. And so, if we go to the next slide, we have two special awards. One of them is is um, is an award based on the 
uh, most efficient use of renewable energy or, or something along those lines. I forget the exact title of it. And so what I want you to think about as you, um, as you look and design your city is, is what resources are gonna be the primary energy sources that might be used for transportation or energy for homes. And so just as, as Kevin mentioned, those are really, uh, you know, heating and cooling homes and businesses are, is, a, is a massive energy input. So, you know, where is that energy gonna come from in your city? What, what are you gonna use for that? Um, how much of that energy should be renewable? And, and how are you going to harvest that energy, collect the energy, store the energy? Um, and then the, another idea that I'd, I'd love you to think about is, and, and again, with your fresh young mind and creativity, I think you can do lots of great things. You know, what are the fringe energy sources that, that 50 or 100 years from now we would all look back and say, ah, oh, I never would have dreamed that would be valuable. And I think of things like a hundred years ago, um, you know, with, with solar energy, um, just as we've saw some photos in previous slides, was that a, a really, was that a concept that was just a dream or was it, or, or was it even more friends than that? Um, what about wind energy? If, if you haven't seen the, the giant, wind turbines that kind of populate the Midwest of the US and other places, you know, who would have dreamed that, that those big wind farms would be producing energy like they do, you know, in, in the United States and, and really around the world. So those are the kinds of things that, that if you think about, you know, if you think about them and, and design some systems or, or create some, some interesting ideas that could be very attractive to those award judges as you move forward. And then related to the food context, we look at uh, a special award related to, um, to, the, to you know, how you're gonna provide food for, for, the, for your population, for your city. And so the things that, that you need to think about are, are what constitutes a healthy diet and, and how are those co components of the healthy diet gonna be made available for the population. So, you know, you think about, you know, you need a certain amount of protein and carbohydrates and vitamins and minerals and those kinds of things. And so what, what are the sources that you're planning to use? So you can think about your diet today. And you may have a certain amount of, of protein that comes from, from meats and poultry and those kinds of things it may come from some dairy. Um, you, you may have your carbohydrates and fats that are built in from from grains and, and fruits and vegetables and those kinds of things. So what, what, what components are you expecting to be available in your city? And so, you know, are you gonna be importing those things? Are you going to be growing them locally? Are you going to be harvesting them uh, in the city somewhere? Or are you gonna be having to bring them in from somewhere else? How are you gonna process those foods? You know, one thing that I rarely see in a in a future city is is a food processing plant. You know, it's it's just often neglected. They'll have a fire station and a police station and a school. Very rarely do I see a future city that actually has a food processing plant or or some way that um, you know thinks about how are we going to make food. Um, and then things like waste handling. You know, producing food creates waste. Um, it create it consumes energy. And so finding ways to, to you know, possibly reutilize that waste um, would be really fascinating concepts for a future city. Um, are, you know, are there underutilized nutrient sources that could be used that could become a major food resource in the future? So, um, you know, those are the kind of things that, that, um, that ASABE members would love for you to think about. And, and like, I, like I said, I think when you think about those things and when you design them into your city, I think you'll also see that they'll have a, a, an overlap and, a, and, a, and probably some, some combination of, of, of um, you know, uh, <clears throat> they'll, I think they'll combine to be effective in other special awards besides just ours. So I appreciate uh, the, the chance to be here. And with that, I'll, I'll let the, uh, the NCAAS group um, Share their, share their ideas. 
great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Terry. That was really interesting. Um, exciting to hear about the work that um, agricultural and biological engineers do. Thanks. Our third and final organization is the National Council of Examiners for Engineering and Surveying, or NCEES. We have two presenters to talk about their work in the field of surveying. Scott Bishop has more than 18 years of experience as a land surveyor in both the public and private sector. He has been involved with all types of surveys and served as an expert witness on multiple cases. Scott is currently the chair of the Utah Professional Engineers and Professional Land Surveyors Licensing Board. He has a BS in Geomatics and was the 2015 Utah Council of Land Surveyors Land Surveyor of the Year. Brad Roberts is a professional land surveyor out of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. He has 11 years of surveying experience. Brad works in the private sector for Sigma Consulting Group, where he and his team conduct various types of surveys from the swamps in Louisiana to fields in northern Mississippi. He is the current chair of his district for the Louisiana Society of Professional Surveyors and is the recipient of the 2017-18 LSPS Young Surveyors Excellence Award. Scott and Brad, welcome to the webinar. Thank you. Glad we could be I here. Certainly appreciate the opportunity to be here. All right. Scott, well, why, don't we you, uh, to... why don't you lead off? Okay. We want to talk a little bit about surveying and uh, just how surveying could be used in this future city competition. We've been, had the opportunity, uh, Bradley and I have had the opportunity to go to Washington, D.C. and participate in the finals judging. And this is something kind of neat. We've got a little video clip we'd like to start off that would kind of introduce surveying and, and talk a little about what surveyors do. Uh oh. Are we not getting the audio through? Technical difficulties, it looks like. Okay, well, let's maybe just jump past the, the video clip here and let's talk a little bit about what surveyors do. Um, so that video actually uh, introduced surveyors, some of the different things we do, and so maybe uh, Brad and I will just talk through that. So uh, as you can see up here, um, surveyors measure and mark um, the earth and things below the earth and above the earth. We can use a variety of different tools. We'll talk about some of those today. Um, but you can see here one of the, the newest and funnest things we get to use uh, are drones. We, we can do a lot with a drone um, that typically took an individual a lot of time to cover that, that much land. And as uh, Brad's down there in the south, and as he mentioned in his introduction there, uh, going through the swamps and things, sometimes a little hard to get through there. But with the drone, you can get up above and, and can see and map things. Um, one thing that, that makes surveyors a little bit different is um, how precisely and how accurately we can mark things. Um, any, anybody can measure things, can have a tape measure or, or different survey type instruments that can measure things, but a surveyor uh, understands what that precision is and can actually tell people exactly where they are. Um, one thing that you will probably be dealing with in your future city is topography. Um, unless you're out in the middle of the country on a flat plain, you're probably gonna have some hills or possibly some mountains and you're gonna to have to figure out how to set your city up in that to make the best use of the land, whether that's for um, people to get around and about, uh, but also to keep the beauty and those things are there. Um, we'll go out there and, and locate all those things and, and give that to an engineer, and they'll usually take that information and design their city. So you guys would take your existing topography, design your city to fit in there, and then the surveyor would be the one that would go place that out there on the ground and, and lay that out there. And then so we do a lot of other things. We can be expert witness where people have property disputes um, from your next door neighbor to actually international boundaries. Surveyors get involved with that. Brad, do you want to talk about anything else that surveyors do? No, I mean, I think, uh, I think we'll cover a good bit of it in the next couple of slides. Uh, before, we, before we really get started, uh, I, I do want to congratulate every one of you um, that's participating in the competition. Uh, you know, Scott and I, he mentioned, we've, we've had the opportunity the last couple of years to, to go and uh, do the special uh, awards judging for the, for the national competition. But 
on a regional level and, and uh, everyone that's involved with this competition, I mean, congrats. You guys are, are already rock stars. I mean, uh, this this competition has, has really shown me and, and Scott, you know, how, how smart you guys are and how, how uh, devoted you are to the various professions and, and you know, bettering uh, the world as, as the years go on. Um, I, I think we can skip over to the next slide. We'll, we'll touch on a couple of areas of surveying. Um, you know, you'll see, you'll see we've got eight here uh, and, and that's, you know, that's not at all what surveying is limited to. Um, you know, these are just kind of the, the big areas. Uh, there are always niche markets in, in any industry, but in, in surveying, uh, there, there's no exception. So in, forensic surveying, uh, Scott mentioned in his in his bio that uh, he, had, he had served as expert witness for some some court cases. Uh, we would we would go out on some of these cases and per se an accident site or, or something of that nature. Uh, we would collect data that would help support those those particular cases. Uh, and that's kind of that's kind of what forensic surveying is in a nutshell. Uh, Construction surveying the the layout of, of particular features. You, you look around. You're probably sitting in a classroom or a building or computer lab or something like that. That building was likely laid out by a surveyor through the construction company. Uh, you look outside the the streets, the, the curbs, the gutter, all of these features that you will implement into your future city. Those tend to those tend to be laid out by a, a professional land surveyor because we we as we lay things out we have to pay attention to uh, private boundaries, private ownerships, and, and the rights that go along with those boundaries. Um, photogrammetry. Scott mentioned drones. A wonderful new tool. Uh, I say new newer tool. Uh, we don't tend to use it a whole lot in South Louisiana just because of the tree canopy. I think Scott and them, it's a, it's a little more applicable out that way. However, I'm not going to tell you we, we don't use it at all. It's, it's an extremely useful tool for stockpile quantities, lay down yards, that kind of thing. Um, just a very quick way to produce digital terrain models and uh, contours for a particular piece of property or, or site that you guys may be working on. Um, <clears throat> Boundary surveying is kind of near and dear to my heart. It's what I do most. And, and like I mentioned earlier, we're, we're talking about, um, you know, boundaries of pieces, parcels of, of property, both private ownership, state ownership, uh, federal ownership, uh, these in, in sovereign nations. We have Native American reservations that have their own laws and, and applicable um, rules for property boundaries. Uh, these these are things that that we are entrusted as a as a profession to render our opinion on, and and that's what I practice most: boundary surveying, large rural acreage uh, boundary surveys, uh, and and what we tend to do is is uh, you know we'll we'll do the surveys on the ground and we'll apply the evidence, the best available evidence that we find will apply our legal principles that we've learned throughout school and throughout our examinations and the licensure process. And we'll apply those principles to what we've found in the field to render our opinion on, on property boundaries. Do a lot of topographic surveying supplemental to, you know, engineering designs. Everything's got to come from somewhere, right? Um, you, your, your civil engineers and, and, these professions, they, they can't do what they do without data. And, and what surveyors do is we provide them that data, whether it be uh, a contracted um, private surveying company providing the, the topographic information to uh, a civil engineering company or a civil engineering company that has a surveying department. It's, uh, it's interchangeable and we work well together um, Scott, you want to touch on a couple of them? Yeah, one that, that we've found several times that's come up is hydro hydrography, um, it, which is people refer to us as land surveyors, but we get a survey uh, underneath bodies of water and, and things up above too. And so uh, a lot of people have used um, resources of the ocean or river, rivers or lakes associated with their cities 
And uh, so you would need a surveyor to go map underneath the water so you'd know where to place um, your power systems or your regenerations or whatever component you're trying to put in there. Um, geodesy is a, a kind of a specialized I don't know if there's much application there in the in the future cities competition, but uh, it's the the in depth and the very precise to know the tops of mountain peaks and and that kind of stuff. Uh, and GIS analyst, um, hopefully you are familiar with that. Uh, most all of the GIS data, which is a is a great tool to visually see and interpret data, has a base fundamental layer uh, of property rights or ownerships um, from whether it's for transit for um, communication, for technology, uh, or for just simple ownership, it's got to be based on some type of a system. And so surveyors will provide that, that base layer, that foundation that you can extract or lay data on top of to work through and understand what GIS or geographic information system is a way to visually see data. Uh, so those are just some different areas of surveying. As BJ indicated, there are a lot more. Uh, but those are kind of the high level stuff. Um, on the next slide, um, we can talk a little bit about different aspects of surveying. Um, every day is, is different. In, in that video clip, we talked about that. Uh, in my firm out here in Utah, uh, we have access to boats and to side by sides. We have drones. Uh, of course, we can get and walk. Uh, we have a brand new mobile LIDAR unit that we can mount on top of a truck and drive 50 miles down the highway and it collects a million points a second. Um, and so we have all sorts of different things. If the weather's bad, I may stay in the office one day, and when it's beautiful like on these good fall days, I like to be outside of the office. Um, as BJ mentioned, we're usually the first ones out there. We collect the data, and then we provide that to the engineers and the architects and the other users of the data, and they do their design, and then we typically take that and put it back out there on the ground. Anything else you want to add, BJ? Uh, yeah, just I know we're we're kind of in our time limit, but you know we we uh, we talk about my my favorite part of the profession and and uh, it is going to be the technology, right? Like we we talk about technology and we get excited about it. There's all these new cool tools that that everyone sees, and you and you might you know have seen them. Um, you see people flying drones. Yes, absolutely, we can use that in surveying. Um, laser scanning is like what scott mentioned his his uh, mobile unit has a has a lidar sensor on it which is light detecting and ranging uh, and it just uses light to collect data um, laser scanner is is a little bit different it's using infrared laser um, you know to to move through a, a particular window of area that you that you define and and it's collecting some some of these things are million plus points a, a second you know these huge data sets that uh, or invaluable to to a particular project. Um, we're using uh, unmanned boats in in small bodies of water to, you know, to map the bottom of of uh, water bodies. Uh, the the technology side of things in surveying is really what gets me excited, and and um, I hope that you guys, as y'all see these tools, you you may be passing someone on the side of the road, got the vest on part of that, the, the whole nine and you're seeing that you know that it looks like they're looking through a camera and we get that all the time but it's, it's very far from it and um, as you as you see these things in real world applications uh, I hope that you guys can can come to appreciate what they actually are and what they're doing in in aiding uh, society and, and how those particular tools can be implemented in your future cities um, again I think we're at our time limit um you guys are awesome and uh scott you got anything nope we're good thank you great thank you so much brad and scott um really great to hear about surveying and the work that you all do thank you so much uh for for that great presentation so now is the time for questions. Um, so feel free to um, type in any questions that you have for any of our four panelists. Uh, just type it into the question space, uh, question box in the webinar control panel. Uh, we have a question from Robin. She asks, uh, Kevin, uh, would you suggest wind, geothermal, tidal power, or something else as a good sustainable um, energy source for a team to consider 
and why would you um, be drawn specifically to certain ones over other forms of energy for the kind of work that um, ASHRAE folks might be doing? I'll give you a politician answer. Yes. Um, <laughs> all of those are viable. It just depends on where your city is going to be located. So if you're obviously on the coast, tidal could be a great thing for you. Um, geothermal in a lot of different areas. So a lot of people confuse geothermal, um, thinking of Yellowstone National Park and geysers and really high temperatures. So really most geothermal is done with just a regular uniform ground temperature. That could be anywhere from 40 to about 60 or 70 degrees. And all we do is use it as a battery. So depending on your location, um, that could be viable. If you're located in a very windy area, um, definitely harness harness wind power. So it, it definitely depends on your location. Excellent. And Ashray supports all of them, <laughs> you know, in, in that context. Great. Thank you. And thank you for the question. Um, the next question is for Terry, um, and it comes from William. He asks, would you recommend a mixture of sea salt, water, and fertilizer to help plants grow? And maybe on top of that, um, are there other kind of um, fertilizer or um, things that are in development or being researched now that you are finding to be very interesting that you think um, folks who are working on a future city might be interested in doing some more research on? Okay, yeah, thanks for the question. <clears throat> um, first, I, I'm, I'm, I'm probably weakest in the, in, the, in the agronomy kind of area, so that science of learning how to grow plants. I, I, I did not even have a course in that subject, so, um, but I do not recommend salt as an additive uh, or fertilizer. I, I'm pretty sure that's going to be, um, it's going to be detrimental to anything you're trying to grow, so you're going to want to avoid that. So most um, most crops are going to benefit from from some ideal combination of phosphorus and potassium and uh, nitrogen, and so those those chemicals those um, for those um, minerals nutrients come from um, a lot of times from protein um, potentially. They also come from you know just from some distinct um, fertilizers that are that are manufactured to do that, but um i think one one thing that uh i i think has got some potential uh and it, and it may relate to to the broad design of your city is um things like um food processing wastes so uh those those streams are going to have a lot of of rich nutrients that that you don't want to waste. I mean, they, 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 they can't be maybe turned into food because they're contaminated by some means, but they, but they could be a really valuable resource for either feeding animals or uh, feeding crops. And so I have seen where things like waste from, if you're not familiar, waste from ethanol plants today are used as a, as a primary feed for cattle and other livestock. Um, and then waste from um, other operations like um, there's an operation called anaerobic digestion that takes um, it takes waste products and turns it into into biological gases or methane and and those those processes produce fertilizers also so it's it's a really valuable technology it's it's not necessarily new but it's I don't think it's utilized fully. So uh, anaerobic digestion is a really powerful technology I would recommend that you might consider uh, because it has byproducts in lots of different ways, both energy and fertilizers. Excellent. Thank you, Terry. Um, our next question is for either Scott um, and or Brad. Uh, it comes from Olivia. She asks, do you ever use scuba gear? Um, and do you use any other, you mentioned a couple of the, the things you use like drones. What other sorts of material uh, tools do you use when you're either um, surveying in unusual places, like maybe underwater or um, other areas that are, are not super convenient? So I have never used. Go ahead, Brad. 
No, go ahead, man. Uh, you can lead off and I'll follow up. So I have never used scuba gear. I think it'd be super fun um, to try that, but we tend to stay on top of a boat, on top of the water. And that way we have reference to the satellite so we know exactly where we are on the water. And then we would use something similar to a sonar below the boat to map the bottom of the water. If it's really shallow, sometimes I'll use a pair of waders. I've actually gone in and just shorts and tennis shoes before too. Brad? And, and, and some other technologies, uh, you know, Scott and I, we, we, we serve with NCs and, and we get to we get to meet a lot of great people from, from out the United States. It's, uh, it's, it's really been a phenomenal experience for me. Um, one of our colleagues in California, he's using a uh, laser scanner, like what I mentioned earlier, uh, to survey accident sites. And he's, utilize, he's utilizing 3D, uh, 3D printers to print the uh, scanned project area. And he's using these, these three-dimensional prints as exhibits in court cases. So it's just something, you know, kind of, I talked about niche markets a little bit, uh, a little bit earlier. It's just one of the things that, that you wouldn't really think that that was a, a, an applicable market for surveying, but I mean, he's, he's killing it. He's, he's doing extremely well with it. He's very good at what he does and, um, you know, utilizing a, a 3D printer alongside of some of this newer uh, technology, such as a laser scanner, he's able to kind of isolate this this market that he's done extremely well in and uh, you know as far as tools go to collect data and and do our job more efficiently and, and safer and uh the really the, the the list is endless you know people are using gopros uh way more than than you would think in in surveying applications um so i i, I think if you can think of a of a, a situation where technology can aid you and, and you can do your job safer and to a higher degree of accuracy, uh, why not use it, right? I mean, it, it's available to you. Excellent. Thank you. Um, our next question is for Kevin, um, and it comes from Keaton. Um, Keaton asks, what do you have to do to be a contractor? Uh, you mentioned in your presentation. Um, do you have to focus on um, specific fields like uh, math and science? And if so, how? Um, thanks for the question. So on a contract, there's a lot of different areas in contracting. And so these are the people who get actually they assist the consulting engineers. So yes, STEM is important, math is important, technology, um, science background, but they're not required to get into that field. So some contractors, um, it's, it's like a trade. So from a trade standpoint, what we have for trade professionals is the ability to go out and use your hands to be a service technician, to be able to service the mechanical equipment, or be able to go in and um, install those pieces of equipment. So it's kind of like an auto mechanic um, or an airplane uh, mechanic. You can get uh, into a lot of different fields for that. Some of them actually do design work. So they know the equipment better than the engineers, the consulting engineers doing it. So they can actually advise the engineer of the project on how that piece of equipment should be implemented into a building. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Um, and we are pretty much out of time at the moment. Um, so uh, if we didn't get to your question, I'm sorry, um, feel free to um, write at info at futurecity.org and we will um, hopefully be able to follow up with any other questions that you have. Um, I wanted to give a big thank you to our four guests who took time out of their very busy schedules uh, to talk with us today. Thank you so much um, for all the fascinating, interesting information. I learned a lot today. It was very, very fun. Um, and also a big thank you to the audience for joining us today. Um, good luck with your 
future city projects. We can't wait to see what you come up with in January. Um, also, please be sure to take the short survey that's going to pop up when this webinar uh, concludes. Um, when we have feedback from you, it is really helpful for us um, when we plan our next webinar. So be sure to um, give an honest um, response in those surveys, and we will be able to tailor our next uh, events to uh, fit your needs as much as possible. Uh, so with that, have a great day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.